We're on Daf Yudam at Aleph, and we were in the we're in the middle of a story. The story that we were learning yesterday is about the calculation of years in contracts and in documents. And the Gemara had said that in Bavel, we calculate many times, at least in secular documents, we calculate based on the rise of the Greek Empire, which we said was 380 years before the Chorban, or 40 years after the construction of the Temple. And when we made a calculation, that is the year 3448 exactly 1,000 years after the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. So the Gemara brought us a story about Rav Nachman. A promissory note was presented in Rav Nachman's Bastin, and it was post-dated by six years. And they didn't know what to do about it. Is this, was it deliberately post-dated to give the advantage to the debtor? Or, or what? What's the story? So Rav Nachman said it's not a post-dated promissory note, but rather, the sofer is extremely precise, and when he dates a star based on the rise of the Greek Empire, he dates it six years prior. Because the reality is the Greeks took over from the Persians after 34 years after the construction of the temple. The reason why other people don't count those <clears throat> six year, first six years is because the Greek Empire was confined to a much smaller geographical area. And they only really spread out as an empire throughout the civilized world after six years in the year 3448. But already in 3442, they were officially, took t- they, t- they had defeated the Persians. Based on that, this sofer had dated it from the year 3442 and not from the year 3448. Okay, is everyone clear on that story? Now we're in the middle of the story. And the Gemara challenges were at the two dots. So Maskifla Rav Acha Bar Yaakov Mimai Dila Malchus Yevon Imaninon Dilma Liyetzias Mitzrayim Aninon Veshavke La Alpha Kama Venakte Alpha Basra Vahai Vahai Meucheru. So the Gemara's question is: Rav Nachman, I'm not satisfied with your answer. Says Rav Acha, his student. He says because maybe the Sofer, instead of counting from the rise of the Greek Empire six years earlier. Maybe he's counting from Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Because remember, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is in the year 2448. Mm. The rise of the Greek Empire is 3448. And all he did was truncate a thousand years. You know, we do that the same thing. What do we say? When we say this year is Tuf Shin Ayin Ches, mm. what does Tuf Shin Ayin Ches mean? It's only the same. 778. We dropped the five. We yeah. dropped the five. Yeah. So maybe this fellow... <clears throat> dropped the, the a thousand years off the calculation of the date, but he really meant that it's from the year. This is the year from. This is the number of years from the years uh, from the time of the giving of the Torah. Maybe that was his criterion. He would have dropped the three. And it is a post dated. It is a post dated star. Doesn't right. work. He wouldn't drop one. He would have dropped three. No, no, no. But he's saying the number of years since Matan Torah. Uh, so since Matan Torah, maybe it's it's just you know a thousand and something, and from or, or two thousand something, and from the Greek Empire, it's maybe a thousand or something. Or or yeah, or may, yeah, right, or maybe it's one thousand something from Matan Torah, and it's let's say eight hundred something from it's like eighteen something from Matan Torah and eight hundred something uh, from the Greek Empire. So he, dropped so he dropped he just dropped the one. Yeah, right. You know. That makes more th- sense. That would be certainly a reasonable thing to assume. And so maybe it is a post-dated promissory note. Yeah. So the Gemara says, Amr Rav Nachman begola in monin el olamalche yavanim bilvat. So Rav Nachman said, no, nah, that's not uh, what a sofer would do in Bavel. In Chutz La'aretz, we only use secular dates mm-hmm. based on secular events, the rise of the Greek Empire. We don't base it uh, uh, on, on Jewish dates, like the giving of the Torah. Now, who saw the Chuyi Kamad Chile, but Nafak Dak Vashkach, the Tanya Begoyle, and Monon Elamalche Yvon and Bilvad? Now, originally, Rav Achim, when he heard Rav Nachman's answer, he thought he was just making up an answer just to blow him off. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, then he investigated Rav Achim, and he discovered that Rav Nachman was actually channeling a Brysa, <clears throat> because the Brysa says that exact point that in Chutz Laaretz, our dates are based on the Greek Empire, not on any. Uh, Jewish events. Same with us. Yeah. We date everything in 2018. We have a, se- we have a secular dating yeah. process. 
You know, there are many people who take offense at if you use the secular date, but you yeah. see that this was a practice right. even in Bavel. Exactly. Yeah. It's the, real the, world. the only difference is is that you know they say it's uh, it's um, it's uh, <clears throat> the it's a date that represents some religious idea, but today it doesn't really represent anything religious. It's just a it's just a system of dating. Yeah. Okay. And I can also prove this point that the date that the Sofer used was not from Matan Torah because the, 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 look at the following Mishnah. This is the first Mishnah in Maseches Rosh Hashanah. And it says that there are two Rosh Hashanahs that we're going to focus on. One is Rosh Chodesh Nisan and the other one is Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. Now, on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the Mishnah says that it's the new year for kings and for festivals. We'll just focus on kings right now. The Amrinan Lamelachim Lamai Hilchasa. And the question is, what do you mean that it's the, the new year for kings? What does that mean? So, Amar Rabchista Lishtaros. It means that when you're dating contracts from the date of the, of the number of years from the king's reign, the cutoff date is Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which means that if it's in, El, if it's in Adar, then it's <clears throat> it's 10 years from this reign, and if it's already in Nisan, it's 11 years. In other words, that's the, 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 the pivot, a switch of the new year for the king is Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Well, for example, if the guy started in Shvat, and he hits, it wouldn't make a difference. He the, hits Nisan, it's now the second year of his reign. Exactly. Even though exactly. he's only been king for two months. Even though he's been king for two months. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly right. Utznan be'echad betishrei Rosh Hashanah lashonim velashmitin. But then, sort of like a couple lines later, it says that on the first of Tishrei is a Rosh Hashanah for years and for Shemitahs. Mm-hmm. And the question was raised, what does it mean it's the new year for years? Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Rav Chista said it's for contracts to determine from the date of the reign of the king, when is the, when is the year switch over, when is the year transition? So Rav Chista answered both. He said Rosh Chodesh Nisan is the transition point, and then the same yeah. Rav Chista said that Rosh Chodesh Tishrei is the transition point. So make up your mind. So how do you reconcile that? And the answer is, Rosh Chodesh Nisan is the transition point for, let's say, if you want to say how many years from the reign of King Solomon, mm-hmm. so you use Rosh Chodesh Nisan as the transition date. If you want to know, for, let's say, King Xerxes, how many years is since his reign, so then you use Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. So now the Anan Hashda Mitishrei Manina. So now, so now the, basically the argument goes like this: says Ravina, when we transition our dates, when do we transition them? On Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. And if the if there was any possibility of us basing ourselves on a Jewish date, mm. like Yitzias Mitzrayim, mm. we would certainly use the Rosh Chodesh Nisan mm. as the transition date, not Rosh Chodesh Tisrei. So you see very clearly from our practice to transition at Rosh Chodesh Tisrei that we're using a secular <coughs> event, a secular king, and not any other event. So that proves to us that this is not a post-dated uh, shtar, it really, the Sofer was basing himself on the rise of Greece 34 <coughs> years after the building of the temple in 3442, and not 40 years after the construction, which would be 3448. So what would happen to Staros if, for example, you have a Jewish king, and the Jewish king falls, and now you have a Goyesha king? Because Where? Where is this happening? Well, let's say after Shlomo Melech, Right, after the, there were no after Goyish, there were never Goyish was, kings in Israel. There was, you, you want to argue King Herod maybe was so not saying, yeah, his saying, lineage, but he's still considered a Jewish king. He called himself so a Jewish king. There would always have Nisan in, in Eretz Yisrael? Yeah, in Eretz Yisrael it would he always be Nisan. supplies the Galos, yeah. right? In Chutz, we're talking about Jews in Chutz Laaretz oh, no, always oh, yeah. date their documents based on right. secular events. So you're saying it wouldn't occur except for in Herod even that would still be by Nisan? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Next, the Yom Ginus Yishel Malchem V'chulei. The Mishnah had said, remember, mm. the whole topic that we're discussing in the first parak is you're not allowed to enter into trade, commercial trade or business dealings with oh, Gentiles three years before their holy days or their days. special days. Yeah. <coughs> One example of that was called the Yom Ginusia of kings. Now the question is, what does that word mean? So my Yom Ginusia shel melachim. 
So Amar of Yehuda, Yom Shemamidim Bo Oivdei Kochavim is Malcolm. It's the day when they coronate their king. Mm. So if you know that there's a special coronation day, I don't know whether that means that it's an annual celebration like Washington's birthday or something like that, or whether it's um, just a one-off. A, a one-off. But the point is, is that three days before the coronation, you're not allowed to enter into trade with them. So v'hatan yom ginusa v'yom shemabinim bo'as malkam. But one second, the Bryce seems to identify them as two separate things. There's a day of coronation is one thing, and yom ginusi is something totally different. So lokasha hadidei hadibrei. So the Gemara answers, you know what? The way you answer it is that no, that the day, day of coronation is for the king himself. The Yom Ginusia is the day of coronating the king's son when, in a situation where the son takes over for the father. But wait a minute. Umi mukmi malka bar malka. rav yosef melech ben melech. Now, this is a very di- difficult discussion to have. Uh, but there's a Pasuk in Sefer Ovadia, where Hashem is speaking to Ovadia, who himself is a descendant of Esav, and he's telling him, your nation that you converted from, right, is going to be the smallest of nations and despised very much. So the first part of the Pasuk, a small nation, means that there's something derogatory about or critical about the nation, <clears throat> and that is that they do not have a dynastical system of monarchy. And it's very important to know that in the eyes of the Gemara, a dynastical system like we had in the Jewish kings is the preferred method. Mm. Now, why that should be is a whole political discussion, and I, I mean seriously political philosophy. Why dynasties, why monar- uh, dynastical monarchies are the preferred system. And as you'll see, the Gemara is going to have more political commentary in a moment. Mm. But if the Rome, Rome is known for not having dynasties because the kings do not produce quality progeny. Mm. And that's what is the source of criticism of Rome, mm. that they are katan, they are small in that sense. So therefore, the, the problem is, how can you tell me that Rome, which is what we're talking about in our Mishnah, has a dynastical system where the son of the king gets coronated. That's not the, the way they work. So it doesn't mean small in number. Because they weren't a small number. They're no, massive. small small means in quality. Yeah, okay. And bazuya tamaod, you're very disgraced. She'en, that's the second part of the pasuk. She'en lahem loksavelolashon, that they have no right, a script of their own. There's no Roman script, and there's no Roman language. Everything is borrowed for the Romans. Now, <clears throat> there's an amazing, an amazing censored Rashi that appears in the Ein Yaakov version. I'm just going to read it for you because it's in the margin of my Gemara. <coughs> and Rashi says that this is an allusion <coughs> to Christianity, to early Christianity. And what, basically what the Gemara means to say is that every document, every literature of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, is erroneous, referring to the New Testament. Sifre ta'usam Yochanan Paulus Petros that their book is full of errors deliberately written erroneously by John and Paul, who were Jews. This Rashi is going according to a book that was known in the medieval period called Toldos Yeshu, the Chronicles of Jesus. And this book was written, it was well known in Jewish circles, but it was sort of had to be buried underneath the surface because the Jews would have been persecuted for it, but it describes how Yashka was a Jew and how both he and his followers who were Jewish deliberately um, deliberately um, uh, distorted Judaism to make Christianity as distant from Judaism as possible so that people shouldn't think that uh, Christianity is like uh, conservative Judaism, like a, for, a, a denomination of Judaism. So they deliberately distorted many rituals and practices. They abolished bris mila and so forth and so on. Dafka to distance Christianity from Judaism. And what Rashi says is that this is what the Gemara is referring to, that the founders of the Holy Roman Empire, the literature of the Holy Roman Empire, namely the New Testament, is full of distortions and lies because the Jews who founded the movement themselves deliberately distorted it. Now, of course, you'd understand why that Rashi doesn't appear in the Talmud Bavli. 
Yeah. Okay, let's go weiter. So the question, therefore, is we see that Rome does not have a dynastical system. So elamai yom ginusia yom haleida. So therefore, what is yom ginusia? It's the king's birthday, which is celebrated as a national holiday. Vahatanya yom ginusia v'yom haleida. One second, there's the brayso that says they're two different things. Lokasha hadidei hadibre. Ah, oh, there's the king's birthday, and then there's the yeah, king's birthday. son's birthday. But wait a minute. Vahatan yom ginusia shelo yom ginusia shel beno v'yom haleida shelo v'yom haleida shel beno. But this brayso says that even the king's son's birthday is different from the yom ginusia of the king's son. So how do you answer that? Selamai yom ginusia yom shamidim bo malkam v'lokasha hadidei hadibre. So we're going back to our original answer. <clears throat> There's a day of coronation for the king himself, and a day of coronation when the king's son takes over as the new king. And your question was, but we don't. There's no dyna- dynastical monarchy in in Rome. That's only as a natural uh, uh, pro- progression of power. But if the king asks permission from the Senate in Rome that, please, can you coronate my son? And they give permission, so then permission will be granted if this, they deem the son to be worthy. And that's Yom Ginusia. That's Yom Ginusia, when the son is coronated by both the king and the Senate. Mm-hmm. Now this, again, is viewed by the Gemara as being an inferior system of government. And it's important to know that the more democratic the government, the more inferior it is in the eyes of the Gemara. And wow. this involves a very long political discussion as why democracy was viewed by people like Plato in the ancient world as being an inferior form of government because you, when you give every single citizen a vote, then you're relying on inferior people who are ignorant. The masses are ignorant. Like and, they, and They don't know what they're talking about, mm-hmm. right? And Robert, same thing with the jury system. You, you idiots. Yeah, right. You get a bunch of you get a bunch of uh, of bozos. Right. So who wants to put who wants who wants the common man to elect people to lead a country? That's what Plato said. That is that, that just doesn't work. Muslims today believe are anti-democratic because they subscribe to this ancient worldview. So just bear that in mind. Anyway, that's the attitude of the Gemara. Rome is inferior because it is based on a democratic system that even the Senate, which is a republic of the people, um, is, uh, is going to choose the, this, the king's son. It's the same reasoning for electoral college. Well, okay, electoral that, college gets, that gets a little bit more complicated. But anyway, let's, let, let, us, let us go weiter. Kagon, Asviros ben Antoninos de Molach. So the Gemara says an example of this there was a king's son in Rome that reigned. His name was Asviros, and he was the son of Antoninus. We're going to learn a lot about Antoninus now. We're going to go through this next Gemara very quickly. Antoninus was a disciple of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He was one of, the, one of the few righteous Roman kings who had a great love for Torah and for the rabbis. <laughs> so, Omer le Antoninus le Rebbe, bo'ina de'im lo chasvirus beritchosi. the temple was destroyed? V'tisave teveria kalanya. <clears throat> so Antoninus was a contemporary of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So clearly it's several, it's at least two centuries after the Chorban, right? So Antoninus is very close with Rebbe and he says, I have two requests to make of the Senate and I know they're only going to grant me one. One is that I want my son Asvirus to be to reign after me and two, I want the city of Tiveria, which is a city full of Chachamim, to be freed from the burden of tax. Which one should I ask them for? So, of course, you'd think, well, Rebbe would say, for the sake of the Jews, free to vary you from tax, but he doesn't. So listen to this. I see gavra arkeve achavre v'yoiv le'yona li'iloi b'yodei v'omer le'litasa emer le'ila de la'mifrach min yodei yona. So <clears throat> instead of Rebbe telling him directly the answer, he played a game of charades. He sent, he brings two people over to Antoninus, one is piggyback on the other. And he puts a dove in the hand of the guy on top. And he tells the guy on the bottom, tell the guy that's on your back to release the dove. And he does, every, all of that is done in front of Antoninus. So, Omar, Shema Mina Hachik Omerli, At Boi Minayo Dasvirus Beri Yimloch Tchosi, Veimle Lasvirus, the Tiavi Tveria Kalanya. So, ah, I get it. I get what Rebbe was trying to tell me in this game of charades. He's telling me that you are the guy on the bottom, your son will be on your piggyback on top of top of you, and so basically you make him the king, 
ask the Senate to make him the king, and he'll release the dove, he'll release Tiberia from having to pay taxes. So you get both. Right, you'll get both. It's like a game of charades. And here's another charades. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Antonina says to Rebbe, the noblemen of Rome are starting to uh, persecute me. They're saying bad things. They're spreading lies about me. Sounds like Trump. Sounds like Trump, right? So, mm-hmm. So Rebbe wa- is walking with him in his garden, and every day he plucked out another turnip from a row of turnips that was growing. But he only did, took out one each day. So, Amr Shma Mina Hachik Amrli At Ketol Chad Chad Minayu Velo Tiskarahu Bekulu So, Antonina said, what Rebbe is essentially advising me is, don't wipe them all out in one day. Pick one off, one every day, or very, very gradually, so that you won't, um, you won't get attacked for it. In other words, the strategy is very Machiavellian, right? Is to is to very deliberately, right, what is it? Revenge is a dish best served cold, yeah. right? In other words, just very gradually and systematically pick each one off, but do it slowly one so that time. one at a time, right? So anyway, this is, this is Rebbe, so basically. Rob, Rob, I told the, the this is how you eliminate your enemies. The so, <laughs> so the Gemara now says, it's like the Godfather. So the Gemara, the, the Gemara says, the Lamar lay Maymar bat beheja. So the Gemara says, why didn't he tell him just directly? Why did he have to communicate this in a game of trades? You know that joke about the rabbi sits in front of the Pope with the apple and everything. But anyways, like, why didn't he tell him directly? Why couldn't uh-huh. he say it outright? So Omar, Shami, Chashu, Veromi, and Mitzari, Lei. So Rebbe was concerned that if he heard that, uh, if the nobleman heard mm-hmm. that the Jewish rabbi was giving advice to the Roman emperor mm-hmm. to, to wipe out his enemies, then they would start persecuting him. Jews. So, v'lei malei balachash, why couldn't he whisper it to him? Mishum d'chsiv ki of hashamam yolech esakol. Because as the Pasuk says, the bird of the heavens will always uh, transport the voice, transport transport the sound. In other words, the wall, it's like we say, the walls have ears. Right. Is essentially what Rebbe was concerned about. Someone will hear about it. Havalei mm-hmm. hahu brata d'shma gira, ka'avda isura, shadu gar gira. So Antoninus had a daughter whose name was Gira, yeah. and she went ahead and she ha- hung out with the wrong crowd and yeah. she did something lewd. She be, she she became she was Mizana. Yeah. So so Antoninus wanted to elude this to Rebbe, so he sent him a plant called a like type of herb called the Gargira, which is a, co- a compound from my daughter Gira is Nigreris. Mm-hmm. She's been drawn after. She's she's uh, she's been influenced by the wrong people. So Shadr le Kusbarta. So he sent him a Kusbarta plant, which I think they say is coriander. And what is Kusbarta? Kusbrata. Slaughter your daughter. So Shadr le Karti. So Antonina sent him back a leek, which in Aramaic is Karti, which means be cut off. In other words, I'm scared. If I have my daughter killed, I won't have any grandchildren. So Shalach le Chasa. So Rebbe sent back a head of lettuce, which means the word Chasa, which from the word Chas, okay, Protect her, meaning that if this is what your concern is, that you, she's going to be your uh, the, the the source of your grandchildren, then you can't you can't touch her, leave her alone. It's like the Simon of Rosh Hashanah. That's right. Similar to most of these, I know, but that's but that's where that joke comes from, you know, with the Pope and the oh, yeah, Rabbi. Yeah, yeah. So Kol Dava Pricha Bimatarasa Vichiti Apumayu. Every day, Antoninus loved Rebbe so much, he wanted to make sure that he had plenty of financial provision. So he would send him a sack filled with gold, crushed gold in the bottom, or gold ingot, and he would have it covered with a layer of wheat so that if anyone discovered it, Amr Luhu, I'm toyu chiti le Rebbe. So he would tell his servants, bring the sack of wheat to Rebbe. He didn't want people to know that he was raiding the government funds to give the Jew money. So Amr le Rebbe lo tzrichna isli tuva. So Rebbe one day says to Antinus, thank you so much, but I don't need it. I'm already a wealthy man. So Amr li havu leman de basrach, de yovi le basroi, de asu basrach, hudasu minayu nefok alayu. So Antonina says to Rebbe, listen, give it to the ones who come after you, meaning your heirs, and let your heirs give it to the ones who come after them, because eventually they're going to need it. Because I know that the, when I'm alive, Rome will take care of the Jews. But we know what happened. It just took 24 years after the rise of the Roman Empire, like we learned yesterday, and they started to hate the Jews. So there were, were periods, there were very rare periods 
of Roman tolerance of the Jews. But the majority of times, it did, things did not go well. So Antonina said, listen, I'll take care of you. I'll tell my son Asvirus to take care of you. But after that, I, there's no, all bets are off, you know. So Havalei Hahi... Especially without a dynastic system. Yeah. Havalei Hahi nakrasa da Hava'ayla mi beise le beis rebi. Um, Antoninus had a tunnel that led, a hidden tunnel that led from his house to Rebbe's house so he could go learn Torah with him. Kol yoma v'maisi treyavdi chad katli abava de vei Rebbe v'chad katli abava de beise. And he would bring two guards with him every day. And one he would position at the entrance of Rebbe's house and one, the other one he would position as he was leaving his house by his door. So he would position the guard by his door, then walk all the way to Rebbe's house, position a guard there, and then he would also kill that guard before leaving Rebbe's house. He would kill both of them. But, and then when he would come back to his house, he would kill the second guard. So There's no witnesses. So he didn't want any witnesses. These are the guys in the red shirts. <clears throat> well, Star Trek. <laughs> oh, okay, the ones who were expendable. The guys in the red shirts, they're all yeah. dead, remember? <laughs> yeah, Rebbe didn't, didn't object since the murder day. Yeah, well, so I think you'd have to explain. First, either Rebbe didn't know, or even when Rebbe knew, oh Antoninus explained to him, these are people are are uh, on death row anyway, so I'm just taking people uh, who are already uh, cons, and I'm just taking care of them. Yeah, Amr Lei, Be'idna da'asina lo nishkach gavar kamach. So Antoninus gave very strict instructions to Rebbe. He says, whenever I come to visit you, I don't want anyone else to be there because I don't want anyone to know that I'm coming to you. Mm. So, so one day he gets into Rebbe's house and he sees Rebbe Hanina mm. is sitting there. So you can imagine how annoyed Antoninus is. Mm. I, I, didn't I tell you that when I'm here, I don't want anyone else to be here. So Amr Lei, Lei Stain Bar Inish. So Rebbe says, you have nothing to worry about. This is not a normal human being. This is not a mortal. This is an angel. So this is, that, I, I'm not disobeying you. So Amr Lei, Ema Lei Lahu Avda Degani Abava Dekoim Velese. So Antonina says, oh really? Let's, let's test the guy. So he tells Rebbe Hanina, go and tell my guard outside <laughs> to please come in. Now, you have to realize the guard was already killed by this point. So he's testing him to see what he's going to do. If you're really not, if you're really an angel, let's see what you, what you got. So, Ozel Rabbi Hanina Bar Chama Ashkechei Da'avakatl. Rabbi Hanina discovers the sentry outside, but the guy's dead. He's with the red shirt. Amar Hechi Avid. So he says, what should I do? E Ezel Ve'emolei Da'katl in Meshivan Al-Kalkala. He says, if I come back and I bring the news to Antoninus that your guard is dead, you're not allowed to bring bad tidings to someone. So, ash b'kei ve'ezel ka mezalzina b'malchusa. And if I just run away, because, you know, just to escape the situation, that's going to get both me and Rebbe in trouble, because that's a dishonor to the king, just to ignore, just to blow him off. So, bo rach mi'olei v'achyei v'shadre. So, Rebbe Hanina davened, using wow. the Sefer Yitzira, the Shem Forash, whatever he used, and he brought this guy back to life, and he brings him to Antoninus, this resurrected guy. So, Amor Yadana Zuti de Ispachu Mechayemesim, you beidin dasino lunishkachinish kamach. So, Antoninus says to Rebbe, Listen, I, you know, I realize this is a holy man, because I see even the, the, the lowest among your rabbis has the power to resurrect the dead. But do me a favor, next time, not even guys like Rebbe Hanin, I don't want anyone present. So Kol Yoma was a low rabbi. He told him he's an angel. But basically, Antoninus was saying, "I'm not falling for this. Mm. I'm not falling for this." Yeah, you're right. He's no angel. We tested him, but I know that even the lowest of the rabbis mm. can do this. Okay, now, well, that's what he meant. Kol Yoma have a l'Rebbe machale mashkile. Every day, Antoninus was mishamesh. He serviced Rebbe by taking care of him. He would give him food. He would give him drink. Ki have a boy Rebbe lemesak lepuria vegachin kamei puria. When it was time for Rebbe to go to bed, Antoninus actually bent over mm. to make himself like a footstool, and he told Rebbe, here, get on my back so you can get into bed. So Amr Lei, Saki Lavi Lepurich. So Amr Lav, Arach Ara Lizel Zuli B'Malchus And Rebbe's response to him was, that's not, to, I, I can't dishonor the monarchy that much. <laughs> to make you into a footstool, I'm not prepared wow. to do. So Amr Miyash Mi Yisimeni Matza Tachtech Lo Ilam Haba. And Antonina says, oh, if only I could be a cushion for your feet in the future world. In other words, he felt it was a tremendous honor. So, Amr Lei, Asina La'alma Da'asei, Amr Lei, In. 
He had once asked Rebbe, will I get a portion in the Olam Haba? And Rebbe said, yes, of course. Amar leva haksiv lo yia sarid lebeis esav. Aye, but doesn't the Pasuk say in, uh, in Ovadja there will be no remnant for the house of Esav, and I'm from Esav. So the Rebbe answered him, Ba'osa ma'isa Esav. Ah. That's only when you behave like Esav, but if you rehabilitate yourself, you will surely have a portion in the world to come. And by the way, this is true about any Gentile. Today. Right. <clears throat> the Gemara said in Sanhedrin, Gentiles can have a portion in the world to come. We're one of the only religions that professes you don't have to be a Jew to get Olam Haba. You just have to be a righteous person. Okay? Mm-hmm. As long as you don't act like Esav. As long as you don't act like Esav. Tanya nami hachi, lo yi yasri base Esav, yachala kol tamalom lebeis Esav, bo samai Esav. The Bryce says the exact same thing. Amar lei v'haksiv, shama edo malchea v'chol nesiyeha. I, but wait a minute, there's a Pasuk in Yecheskel, said Antoninus, that talks about Gehenim. And it says that in this purgatory place, Edom and its kings and all of its princes are there. So how am I going to get to Olam Haba if I'm going to be in Gehenim? So Amr Lei Malcheha Velo Kol Kol Malcheha Kol Nesiyeha Velo Kol Sarel. So Rebbe said, Ah, the way you interpret the pasuk is its kings, but not all of its kings, all of its princes, but not all of its noblemen. So therefore, there are some, will, be, will be some people excluded. Tanya Nami Hachi Malcheha Velo Kol Malcheha Kol Nesiyeha Velo Kol Sarel. So the Bryce says, what's an example of this? Malchea velo kol malchea prat la Antoninus ben Asvirus. Mm. This was to the exclusion of Antoninus, who was a righteous Roman. And kol nesiyeha velo kol sareha prat la ketia bar shalom. And when it says all of the princes, but not all of the noblemen of Rome, will be put in Gehenna. So that's referring to ketia bar shalom, who was a righteous Roman nobleman, who because of his dedication <coughs> to the Jews was executed al Kiddush Hashem, mm. and, uh, and he was a righteous Gentile. So the Gemara says, what's, what's the story about Ketiyah Bar Shalom? What's the story? My Havi. Dehahu kesra dehavasani li Yehudoi. Amr lehu lechashivi demalchusa misha alalonima baraglo yaktena v'yichya yenichena v'yitzta. Er, Amr lo yaktena v'yichya. So there was once a Caesar in Rome who hated the Jews. He was an anti-Semite. And he said once to his noblemen that were assembled at one of his gatherings, and he, he said to them, what do you do when you have a gangrenous limb or a gangrenous piece of flesh on your body? Shouldn't you cut it off? The Jews are a cancer. Why should we have to live with it in pain? So they said, yes, you're right. Cut, cut out the cancer. Cut out the gangrene. So, Amr lehu ketia bar shalom chadad lo yachot lehu lekulhu. So first of all, says ketia bar shalom, and we'll see why he got his name in a moment, Ketia, right, he says, you're not going to be able to do that to the Jews. You know yeah, why? Really. You may kill some of them, but you're not going to be able to kill all of them. The Pasuk says in the Bible, like the four winds of heaven have I spread you out. So my ka'amar. So what does that Pasuk mean? It can't mean that I'm spreading you out to the four winds all, of, all over the empire, because then Yutaka would be able to kill them all if you could find them all. But it means that they're like the four winds, which means, mm-hmm. It doesn't say, to the four winds, but they're like the four winds, which means that just like the world needs all of the winds coming from all of the directions for the climate to be able to be temperate, so too the world cannot exist without the Jews. And so if you try to kill them, you're just going to be committing suicide because the world will not be able to exist. And furthermore, uh, O Caesar, they're going to call you an excised, a king that excises his own people. You're going to be called a king who cuts off his own Roman citizens. And that's not right. You don't want to get that reputation. You don't want to get that name. And maybe that's where his name Ketia comes from, but you'll see there's another reason. So the Caesar says to him, you have given me a virtuous response. In other words, this, 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 this answer has merit. However, there's only one problem. Anyone who defeats the Caesar in debate gets put to death. Wow. And the decree is, the law is, is that you get put into a house filled with dirt until you suffocate. So you're right. I won't kill the Jews, buried alive, but you're going to be buried alive. So, so as he was being taken out for sentencing, so a certain matron says, cries out, woe to the ship 
that does not have its proper duty. In other words, it hasn't paid its tax, so it won't be able to go forward anymore. What she was saying to him is, too bad you're still dying as a pagan, and you never converted to Judaism. So, nafal al du urla se kata. So at that moment, he fell over himself, in other words, crouches down, bites off his foreskin, or cuts off his foreskin. It's not really clear what he did. And Omar, yahavis michsi chalfis vavris. So he says, I've paid my duty, I've paid my tax now. I'm now circumcised and I commit myself to the God of the, of the Jews and I'm ready to now to pass, to pass through. Let me, let me now pass into the next world. So basically, there's two reasons why he's called Ketia. One is because he, that was part of his argument to the Caesar, they're going to call you a, a king who excises and also because he excised his foreskin. Now, he, as he was about to be executed, he makes a proclamation he says, all of my assets, as a nobleman, he's probably very wealthy, shall go to Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues. Yatza Rabbi Akiva vidarash levanav mechzalarnu mechzalavanav. So uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva hears this and he says, well, that means that I get half and my colleagues get the other half because that's the same halacha. In the Torah it says that the showbread, the lechem upon him, shall be divided by Aaron and his sons. So if Aaron has two sons, do you think that everyone gets 33%? No. Aaron gets half and his sons divide the other half in, 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 in quarters. So you see that when he says Rebbe Akiva and his colleagues, he means half to Rebbe Akiva and half to the other Chacham. It says something interesting below. It says that the Tagoy can still go to Olam Abba without doing a bris. Yeah. But they go to Gehenna first. Aha. Uh-huh. And this guy... Ketia Bar Shalom wanted to make sure that he got a smooth uh, trip straight with the, one of the... On ex- the ship. He wanted the express route. Okay. He didn't want to go to the hand. There you go. So, Yatsa Sabaskal Ketia Bar Shalom Olam So, a heavenly voice rings out and says that Ketia Bar Shalom mm-hmm. merits the world to come. So, Bacha Rebbe Ba'amar Yesh Kona Olama Bisha Echas Yesh Kona Olama Bikama Shan. So Rebbe cried. This uh, this uh, statement appears three times in Shas, yeah. where Rebbe cries, and he said, "Some people have to spend their whole lives yeah. getting Olam Haba, and some people can get it in one valorous moment." Antonina Shimshe la Rebbe Adar Kan Shimshe la Rav, and finally Antoninus served Rebbe as a disciple, and we had a similar story several years later where Adrichan. A darkan is that it? A darkan also a king. A served. He was some kind of of a Babylonian dignitary, wow. and he served Rav. Kishachev Antoninus Amar Rebbe Nispar de Chavila. Kishachev a darkan Amar Rav Nispar de Chavila. And when each one of them died, in other words, when Antoninus died, Rebbe cried out, "Oh, the bundle has been unpacked, unpacked or uh, unleashed," meaning the love between us has all fallen apart. And I think what he was basically saying is that not only has the love between two individuals been lost, but now the connection between Rome and the Jews has also mm. been untied and unbound. And the same thing Rav said when it came to Ad, Ad, oh. um, Adarkan. And tomorrow we'll learn the story about uh, Unculus Barclonimus, the famous Unculus. Have a great day. Uh, uh, Rabbi, another time they had that